Thank you for coming to my talk. I know it's been a long day, starting with a uh, depressing keynote about the state of uh, functional programming and Scala, and uh, filled with uh, type signatures, Haskell references, and whatnot. So uh, I'm sure uh, you all have had a long day, and uh, thank you again for sticking around. So um, I'm Itamar. I'm a uh, freelance software developer. I'm based in the uh, center of Israel. I work in, uh, around Tel Aviv. I've been doing uh, functional programming for the last few years. I uh, specialize in uh, helping companies break down monoliths into microservices and uh, do some DevOps along the way, all with uh, functional programming. I also co-organize the uh, underscore Scala meetup. And uh, of course, help me up if you'd like to work together. I'm always uh, interested in chatting. And um, throughout the talk, my uh, Twitter handle is uh, down at the bottom of the slide, so feel free to tweet at me if you have any questions or things you'd like to follow up on. So what we're going to talk about today is about a few things. Uh, among them, why event sourcing and CQRS, and what, are, what is CQRS, are worth your time. We'll see how we can use just plain functions to implement these sort of patterns, and we'll see how um, abstractions from functional programming can help us implement these succinctly, and we'll shortly see how we can um, hook these up to a stream. So without further ado, because we have a few slides to get through, let's get started. So event sourcing and CQRS. These are big buzzwords, right, very impressive. Um, the first uh, time I've seen uh, these uh, um, terms are on Martin Fowler's webpage. You know, a big 20-page uh, article about CQRS and event sourcing. And, you know, um, it's, it's a lot to digest. So I thought I'd spend like a, a few minutes just to convince you why these are worth your time succinctly, not too much in depth. This won't be a complete, complete treatise of uh, event sourcing and CQRS. And to help me, I've um, convinced one of the startups I'm working with, um, called Art Vandalay Hotels, to share their system architecture with me. Now, this is a run-of-the-mill web architecture. They, they're um, implementing a sort of hotel booking service, and uh, they have a bunch of services. They have a static assets service that merchants can upload their images onto. They have a room rate tracking service that merchants can update their room rates on and they have a booking service and a reservation service. Now, let's see how a typical transaction in which a user would like to book a hotel in this architecture looked like. So first, the user um, wants to actually book a hotel, so he opens up his browser and um, sends an HTTP request to the API gateway to fetch the um, room uh, uh, images. And after that, he'll fetch the room rates, and he'll fetch the um, actual um, open slots in the, uh, from the reservation service. So each request go to, goes to a different service. Now, once he's done doing that, he will um, send a request to the booking service, which will actually coordinate the um, booking transaction. So the booking service will again reach out to the reservation service to create a reservation, and the reservation service will need to verify that the uh, room rates are still um, up to date, so it will reach out again to the room rate tracking service. So this is pretty straightforward, right? This is how we write services, request response semantics. It's a rapid fire development. You just you need another piece of information in your transaction. You just ship another HTTP request. It's great, right? No, uh, no doubts here. But what happens when one of these services goes down? So now, in this diagram, the room rate tracking service, someone deployed a bad version, and now no one can see any current room rates. This is bad. This is bad for, uh, for user experience. The user can no longer complete his transaction, and of course, he's just out of here. No prices? Who's going to book a hotel without any prices? So this is not the only downside to this sort of architecture. Um, we also lose determinism through our transaction in this sort of architecture. 
Whenever we retry an HTTP call, we might get a different result back from the service we are reaching out to. This is not a sort of system I'd like to debug. You know, bugs in production, not getting reproduced locally, not fun. Now, apart from that, we're also piling up the entire system into a single transaction. See, all services are involved in this transaction, which does not make a highly available system, but rather a lowly available system. We're now multiplying the probability of uh, a defect in each service to get the overall probability. And, of course, this is the exact opposite from why we'd like to do microservices. This is not decoupled in any way. This is highly coupled and barely autonomous. And this has a name. This is not a distributed microservices architecture. This is a distributed microlith. So, what can we do to fix this? Well, the answer, lately, in the last few years, has been just to use events. So, events are a pretty interesting concept, and to demonstrate how they can be used, I've attained another um, infra uh, architecture diagram for another startup called Pennypacker Hotels. So Pennypacker Hotels, they've gone on a different path. What they've done is export events from each of their services and subscribe to them from other services that are interested in those events and create a local cache in each service that needs the information. So for example, the room rate tracking service, whenever it receives a request to update a room rate, will export an event to some sort of outgoing stream of events, and the booking service, which now will serve uh, requests for getting the current room data, will um, retain a local cache, that little red uh, circle there, a local cache of the current room rates. And that local cache can be used to serve requests. And let's see how that works. So in this case, when the user would like to fetch the price and the photos, that request can be served entirely by the booking service, which keeps a local cache of the data from the room rate tracking service and the static assets. And what happens when the user would like to book a, a hotel? Well, It'll, he will reach out to the booking service, which will reach out still to the reservation service, and that service will be able to fulfill the request without any other services involved. Which is pretty cool, because now, when things go wrong, uh, nothing um, is affected, because we can just complete our transaction, so in this case, the room rate tracking service is down, Nothing is affected because all the data is cached locally in the, in the other services. And we can still complete our transaction without any defects, which is pretty nice. This is what we're um, aiming for, right, um, in our uh, decoupling of Microsoft. So what we've done here is instead of focusing on the objects that comprise our domain, we're focusing on behaviors, right? We're guiding our service division by the behaviors of each service. So which behaviors are exhibited in, the, in this architecture? Well, a booking can be created, and a reservation could be updated, and a room rate might change. And the process of coming up with these sort of behaviors is called event store. So this is great. Um, we've handled properly the um, writing side of our system. What about responding to queries? So in this case, let's say we'd like to respond to a query that would like to um, uh, display the active reservations currently available. So our reservation service will output an event for each reservation creation to an event stream. And we could do some sort of uh, fold on the reservation streams, on the event stream, to project the active reservations currently available. But this is slow, because an event stream could be long. We could be a very popular company with a successful business, and the event stream could be long. So what we will do instead is keep another cache inside our service that is fed from the event stream, outputted in this service, 
And this cache can be used to serve incoming queries. And this store is a read-optimized store that can be used to answer incoming queries. All right, so this is pretty simple. There is no rocket science involved. And you could now say in your CV that you know CQRS, because this is everything CQRS is about. CQRS is about separating the store which, you, which we use to um, handle our write requests and the store which is used to handle our read requests. And that's about it. So what do we gain from this sort of architecture? Well, first, um, we gain a faster response time because not many services are involved. Next, we gain availability because Again, not many services are involved. We just need to handle one service, make it work, and we get our good availability. And lastly, as we've said, um, we get determinism, which is a very, very, very um, important point, especially when you're debugging production systems. Um, in a way, you could say that event source services that do not need to reach out to other services are kind of like pure functions. All their output is determined entirely by the input that they get, by the command that they get. So this is pretty cool. Now, there are many more things to say about CQRS and event sourcing, and unfortunately, the um, infrastructure and libraries available for, uh, for building these sort of microservices today in Scala is not great. You either need to choose between Kafka Streams or Akka Persistence, Two choices that are not great if you're into functional programming. Um, but talk to me afterwards. We might, um, you might find what I'm doing right now interesting. So speaking of pure functions, let's see some code. Okay? So the examples ahead assume that we have these imports in place. And what we're going to do is zoom in to the reservation service and see how we can implement it using, well, we'll see. So let's first event store this. What commands and events do we need to implement? Well, we might be asked to, in terms of commands, create a reservation, update a reservation by adding a person, and canceling a reservation. And the events that we're going to emit are a reservation might be created, a reservation might be updated, and of course, it could be canceled. So in terms of actual code, what this looks like in Scala is a sealed trait of reservation command with a few subtypes, create, modify, guess, and cancel, that contain the parameters sent to us on the command. Um, we'll, we'll focus mostly on the creation command because we don't have infinite time. And in terms of events, what we're going to emit are these sort of events. Um, each event will contain the parameters pertaining to the reservation it is uh, describing. And uh, they mostly mirror the commands because um, most commands cause an event to be emitted. So this is how it looks like. And let's now plan what we're going to do. So we have our command coming in. And first, we need to validate it. We need to validate commands because, because we need to ensure that we don't persist to the event stream something that is invalid. For example, we don't want to persist a command, or sorry, an event, that will cause a reservation to be created with negative guests. After that, we'll generate our events. Um, that little envelope is that is the event we're going to use. We'll then use the event to mutate our internal state. And after that, we'll emit these events to our event stream and persist the state snapshots every now and then. So technically, what we need is a way to validate our command, uh, state representation and mutation, some sort of mechanism for that. Um, we need some sort of event generation mechanism, and persistence. And who better to help us with these tasks than our friends, the functions, the pure functions, and the types. We're going to use types that precisely describe our computation and what we're doing whether we are generating events or validating commands, we're going to use types that precisely describe the computation that we're using. 
and use them to model the entire function that we're going to write. Okay, so let's get started with validation. We want some sort of command, right? Um, the command, the, the uh, want some sort of function, sorry. The function should take a command and it should return some sort of type, some sort of value of a type that describes the result of the validation. So of course, whoops, sorry, breaking surprises. So of course, the uh, type that we can use is the either type. The either type can be used to describe computations that can fail. So in our case, the error on the left side will represent a validation that failed. And we have no return type um, other than the fact that we have succeeded, so we return unit on the right side. So either it's a type in the standard library, um, nothing fancy here yet, and we'll add some type aliases to reduce the verbosity and to make the uh, text bigger in my slide. Um, um, we'll alias um, error to string, and we'll alias result of A to be an either of an error or an A. All right, so we're just fixing the left slot of our either. And now our process command function looks like this, takes a command, returns a result of unit. All right? So let's write our first simple validation. Our first function will be, as I described earlier, a validation that makes sure that no guests can be negative on incoming command. So I check the, uh, the, the guest's value. If it's negative, I return a left. If it's right, I return, a, if it's positive, I return a right. Pretty simple so far. Notice that we don't need anything um, in terms of, of state. We just need the current command and we give back a validation result. All right, so let's try now some sort of a stateful validation. So to write a stateful validation that um, checks that there are no duplicate um, reservations on the same room, uh, we will need some sort of state representation. So what we've done here is just add a case class for reservation and some sort of interface that can return a current and maybe existing reservation in terms of the room ID. So by room ID, we'll get, take an ID and give us back an option of an, a reservation. So now we can write our stateful validation. It'll take a command and it'll take the uh, reservation state and it'll check if the option returned from the reservation trait is um, defined or not. If it is defined, we'll return a left value and if it's not, return a right value. All right. So, um, our command processing function now looks like this. We take the result of the two validations and we use a function called tupled and a function called void to somehow combine them together. So this tupled function is um, a function that allows us to kind of zip together two validations to result into one value. And of course, this will be short circuiting. If one of them fails, both will fail as well. So in this case, if guest validation is a left, or if dupe validation is a left, then tupled will be a validation two, will be a left two. And you can see that tupled takes both values out of the validation result and tuple them inside one result, which is what its name um, implies. Okay, interesting. So this function comes from cats, okay? If you remember, we've imported cats a few uh, slides ago. And this function is a syntax enrichment that comes from cats. And it is, as I've said, very similar to zip. You can zip to lists and you can zip to results. Now, um, what else can we say about result? So result is an applicative. It's an applicative functor, which means we can use tupled and we can use a whole bunch of other combinators. It is also a monad, so we can sequence functions that are dependent on each other using four comprehensions. We can sequence functions that return result values using four comprehensions just by the fact that this is a monad, that this, this has a monad instance. 
Now, of course, result, my result doesn't have a monad instance. The either type from the standard library has a monad instance in the cats library. Now, a few more side notes because um, this is all I'm going to say about validation. Um, as I've said, it's short circuits or validation. If both validations fail, we will only see the error message for the first validation. And you could look into the validated data type in CATS. It's also in Scala Z, um, called validation, Scala Z, uh, for a solution. Okay, we're not going to cover it here, but that will allow you to see all errors. And applicatives are essential for combining independent computations like this sort of computation here. And you should definitely look into that and into the map and left shark and right shark combinators, those uh, funny symbols there. And this is very essential to functional programming with these sort of values. So as I said, this is all I'm going to say about validation because this is everything we need. We just write a function returning an either, we give it what it needs to compute its result, and we combine it with the applicative combinators, and this is all we need. We validate our data, and we get our short-circuiting behavior if we want it, or we can use validate and, use and get accumulating behavior. And this is everything we need to do validation, right? We don't need any fancy frameworks. We don't need any fancy schemas. We just need functions and types, all right? So next in our plan of attack is generating events. What we're going to do is um, add another function for generating events. So we're going to call it events. It'll take the current reservation state and the current reservation command, and it'll return a list of reservation events. And we can combine it with the uh, pro previous function, with process command, by mapping and replacing the unit value inside our result with the result of applying events. So what this means is that if validation fails, we will have no events generated, all right? Now, of course, since we're using list, we can decide to emit zero, one, or many events. List allows us this sort of choice. Now, it would be great to do this if we can cleanly separate validation and event generation. If these are uh, not dependent on each other, if no information needs to be passed from the validation function to the event generation function, this is great. This is a great solution. But this is, isn't always possible because domain rules can be quite complex and we sometimes need to um, generate different events based on the details of the validation results. So what we'll do instead is we will upgrade our validation functions with some sort of event emitting behavior. What we'd like them to do graphically is still return their two results, those small arrows coming out from the functions, but we'd like to also output some events on the side and we'd like them to be concatenated, the events, because we'd like to uh, describe one single computation that performs validations and combines the events that are emitted from them. So, there is a cool data type in CATS and it's called, it, called writer T that we can use here. So writer T is a simple wrapper for a value of, a, of some sort of F, some sort of effect, that wraps a tuple of a log and a value. So writer T, in essence, is just a simple wrapper for a tuple inside something. Now, we'll modify our validation return type to be write t of result list reservation events and a, which means that in fact we are returning, still returning a result, but we are returning a tuple of list of reservation event and an a. That's all we're doing. Now, when we use that same tuple syntax, and you'll see that I have not changed at all what I have uh, what I've written before for our. Uh, command processing function, I still use that same tuple syntax. What I'm going to get back is a value of a tuple, and it has actually concatenated the result for me, the list of events. So um, what I've got here, I can peel using run. If I do writer.run, 
I can peel this back to be a result of a list of reservation event and a unit because our original functions return a unit. And this list of reservation events is actually all the events emitted from all functions, from all these smaller validation functions. And if we only want the log, only want the reservation events, we can use written, a function available on writer t. And let's give this type a new name. I'm going to call it events end a. All right, so whenever I have a value of this type, I know I have a log of events and an a, assuming that the validation succeeded. Now here's an example of how one of these functions would look like. I am still validating the uh, amount of guests, and now I am using something called lift f to move my uh, previous left result into writer t. And with put t, I can log an event to my, uh, to my log. Now, um, let's move forward. Our functions now validate and generate events. And this is all we need, right? We don't need any fancy frameworks, just functions. Our functions now, by still using that same tupled syntax, both do validation on our commands, and they concatenate the list of generation events, of reservation events, for us. And, of course, if validation fails, everything still fails. No events are emitted. Now, a few side notes on writer t, as we've done with the uh, result. Um, writer t is also a monad in the applicative, which means that we can use the same combinators that we've seen before. We can use four comprehensions, and we can use map n and left chart and right chart to compose functions that return these sort of values. And do note that writer t can be quite allocation heavy. Now, uh, Pavel talked about this in his talk. And I will uh, mention a, some sort of solution to this at the end of my talk. And um, that's about it. Okay, so next up, we need to mutate our internal state now that we've um, emitted our events. So do note that our functions don't do anything currently. Our process command function doesn't do anything currently. It just takes the reservations, takes a command, and returns events and units. Okay, so this is pretty great because we can reason about this function just by looking at the type, type signature. Of course, this is only if you're doing pure functions. If you're doing side effects in your functions, no guarantees there. But we can reason about this function just by looking at its type signature. Because it takes a reservation, takes a command, and returns events and a result. Nothing else happens. What you see is what you get there. Now the path of least resistance to mutating our state is just to return a new state. So we'll stuff the um, reservation, the new reservation state, in a tuple along with our events and unit. Now of course, um, we would like to guarantee that um, the reservation state was not modified in case the um, events and validation failed. Now this is not guaranteed in this signature because we could modify reservations and return a new copy from process command. So what we'll do instead is stuff reservations inside events end. So instead of returning a unit, we return reservations inside our events end, which I remind you, contains a validation component. So if this fails, we just keep the previous state, right? So this is great. We can now still um, use our functions as before, but now we need to reconcile the two states resulting from each validation function. So each validation function returns events and reservations, and we tuple them and we get back an events end of a tuple of two copies of our state. So we need to somehow reconcile this. This is not fun, okay? We don't we want to diff state and whatnot. So what we'll do instead is somehow upgrade our functions to carry and thread our states between the function applications. So what we want is that valid guests to operate on S0, on an initial state, Output an S1, which will be passed to validate dupe, 
which will be outputted um, with S2. And our final result will be S2 with the log of events. This is what we want. So let's modify our function slightly before continuing. This is our original signature. This is valid guests. And we're just going to move the reservations state to the right-hand side of the signature. So now um, we can give this a name. We, this is actually, um, the bottom signature is actually state t. So state t is a wrapper for a function that takes an initial state and returns a value inside f, some sort of effect, of a tuple of a resulting state and a value. This is pretty similar to writer t, but instead we have a state threaded through. So we'll add yet another type alias on the top called command processor, which is state t of events and reservations of a. And we will now modify our two functions to use command processor as their return type. And we now no longer have to take the initial reservation state. So when we apply um, tupled again to our tuple of validation results of the uh, command processor results, um, we note that the initial state has somehow disappeared because we no longer need it. So to run these two functions, we actually need to run them. And we call run on state t and we supply the initial state. And now this does a whole bunch of stuff. This will take our initial state, thread it through both functions, generate some events, do some validations, and give us back the validation result, the list of generated events, and the resulting state. All with just functions and types. Pretty cool. So the way we write these sort of functions is kind of horrible because we need to do a whole bunch of lifting and type annotations and whatnot. But you know, this is fine. This is how we write functional programming in Scala, right? Don't worry. Um, as I've said there, I'll reference a possible solution for this at the end of my talk. So to summarize, um, I bet you're loving the boilerplate that we've seen, um, and it gets worse as you add more layers. Um, as before, state t is both a monad and an applicative. Okay, so you can use, again, the same combinators that you've already learned from applicative and monad, the four comprehensions, the map n, and the left chart and right chart. And as you've noted before, process command has not changed at all as we've changed the types. It's the same tupled syntax that we apply to, to the both validation results. So we now have a pretty powerful type as a building block. We have result, events, and, and a command processor. And if we expand all of these types, we get some sort of uh, complex type signature which we can graphically decompose to see how each element of it add, adds a sort of capability to the function. So in this case, the function that we're using, this command processor, can fail because it has an either component in its type signature. And this function can keep a log because it returns a list of events, right? And this function can also perform a stateful computation because it takes an initial state and returns an output state. Pretty cool, just by composing functions and types. And um, is that it? Is that everything we need to create our command processing um, flow? Well, this does a whole bunch of things, but we uh, still need to hook it up to a, some sort of a stream, a source of commands. Okay, these commands need to come from somewhere and up till now we've only processed a single command. So, um, where do commands come from? Well, they ca can come from, from HTTP requests, they come from Kafka topics or just then CSV uploaded to our application and just at once for I don't know what. And treating these as infinite streams can make our life much, much easier because we don't need to um, think too much about the multiplicity of our event sources, command sources. 
So we'll use um, FS2, a purely functional uh, streaming library for these, for the examples, and they'll be short, they'll not be complete, but ACA streams can definitely work too. All right, check, check the slides when I publish them, there are slides at the, uh, at the end. So FS2 is based on one type, stream, of some sort of effect and an element type. So effect can be cat's IO, monix task, scala's IO, not future. Future is broken and not referentially transparent, so you cannot use it with FS2. Just saying. Um, sorry? Okay, so to run our command processor, what we're going to do is use a function called map accumulate that lets us carry some sort of state through our stream. And map accumulate um, takes a function from state and element and returns, a, and returns a value of state and out and makes that the result of our stream. And we'll set element to be command, state to be reservations, and out to be reservations and list of reservation events. And now we can just run our process command function um, inside map accumulate. And whenever we get a left error value, we keep the current state and emit nothing, emit no event. And when we get a right value, we return next state and the element that we'd like to output. So now on the next round of map accumulate, next state will be used to um, perform the next computation. So, um, we now need to handle persistence, right? We haven't emitted anything, we haven't persisted anything, and, you know, persistence with streams is pretty easy. You just write a function that takes the events and a function that takes the state, returns an IO or a task or a Scala Z IO or whatever of unit that persists these, fun these uh, values, and you use eval map or map async with ACA streams, and you're done, right? And if we'd like to, I don't know, debounce the stream of snapshots and persist them every once in a while, we can just do that. There is a combinator for that in most streaming libraries because streams are kind of like god mode for control flow, and you should definitely use streams to structure your applications. Okay, that's it. That's, that seems kind of dull for a um, impressive keyword like CQRS and event sourcing, but that's it. that is essentially almost everything you need to write an application this way. So where do, where do you go from here? Well, the solution to motor transformer overhead, the solution to the writer T and safety and their overhead, is called finally tagless, and um, the gist of it is that you keep the effect abstract. Instead of describing state T and writer T concretely, you keep the effect abstract throughout the application, and you constrain it with um, constraints that describe the capabilities required of it. At the end, you interpret into a single type that can describe everything, like task and IRF or whatever, and you get all the benefits of pure, purely functional programming and the performance from, um, that we'd like. Um, so, of course, if this seems complex, you can also hire me and I'll help you make it work. And um, I've included a few resources here, um, a few links to uh, articles which I found interesting and I'll publish this and you, you can use them at your own leisure. So, the, um, the, the slides which I uh, will publish really shortly contain a few bonus slides um, about scans and traversals, which were in the headline, which we have not had time to cover, and how traversals and scans are, relate to these sort of applications, and uh, some Arca Streams examples, and uh, you know, check them out. Thank you so much. <laughs>